What if I told you there's a reason why some movies soar to the skies, while other equally cinematic and spectacular films nosedive and die without a trace? What if I told you there's a reason why some franchises take off and are loved and others are forgotten without a trace, unloved forever? What if it's perfectly explainable and even predictable? What if there's a very good reason why fans turn against their own franchise and studios that create things that fans have loved for decades end up being hated by those very same fans? I have a theory. And if you make films or science fiction, or you just love films and science fiction, or you just really hate what's going on in the fantasy fan bases right now, then you need to listen to what follows. There's two things to understand. The second I'm gonna talk about in another video. But right now, I wanna to explain to you what I mean when I say participational cultural mythology. Storytelling is the oldest art form there is. I'd even suggest that all other art forms came from it. It's the oldest form of education and we can easily dismiss it as fun or a hobby and say that people take it too seriously, but it's an essential part of the human condition both individually and as a society. A study by Grinnell University traced fan culture, aka participation culture, back to Star Trek in the 1960s, but it's way bigger than that. Cultures are built around the stories that we tell. The earliest civilizations would explain the world around them through myth. They would create fictional explanations of factual events to help them understand and process the world. And then they'd create stories in order to discuss or communicate ideas. But it goes further than that. The art, the cultures, the practices, the rituals, the dress code, all based around these myths, these stories that we would tell. And then we would fight over our myths. We would go to war against other cultures because they tell different stories. That's how important our stories are to us. They're not just fictional ideas. And even when we know they're fictional, we still build our cultures around them and we're happy to do that. Story is the central glue, the point of convergence of any culture. If I was to say, the first copyright was in 1710 and the first law passed in 1624, you'd be like, oh, here come the lawyers to ruin everything. And while I'm not saying that, it's not far from the truth. For 300 years, stories have had owners, but for 44,000 years, myths have been owned by the cultures who tell them. Now, I'm not saying that George Lucas doesn't have the rights to protect and sell his creation. Of course he does. But understand this. Disney owns Star Wars, but Star Wars belongs to the fans. Not in any legal or financial way, but a cultural phenomenon belongs to the culture and every studio wants a cultural phenomenon. If you want to build a cinematic universe, then you want viewers to become fans. And those fans create a fandom and that fandom is a culture. If you want ticket sales and merch sales, then you want a culture. If you want fans who will sell your franchise for you, wear your t-shirts like mobile billboards and nag their friends into going seeing your films time after time after time, you want a culture. If you want the assurance of bankable returns before you've even made the movie because you know that those fans have already invested in the franchise, then understand that they're investors, they're partners, they're part owners. Maybe not of the intellectual property, but of the myth because this is no longer just a movie or a TV show. This is a culture, and specifically a culture based around a myth. And if you want people to buy into a myth, you have to accept that once they've bought it, they part own it in some sense. You may own the property, but the culture owns the myth. I'm not just talking about fictional stories that come and go. A million movies a year are made that we either ignore, we watch them and kind of like them, or watch them and forget about them. But once something becomes loved so much that people want to live in that fictional world, well, that's the point where it becomes something more than a viewing experience. See, myths aren't just stories. They're stories where everyone's a participant, not just creators and consumers, but partners. You see this made real in sci-fi and fantasy through cosplay and fan fiction. They don't just read or watch stories, they choose to enter them, live in them, filter the world around them through elements of these ideas. Some cynics might say that this is silly and childish, but that's just ignorant to the fact that this is 40,000 years of cultural conditioning. 
And the fans love to do this, and the studios love the returns and the bankable ticket sales and merch sales. So everybody wins, right? And here's where it all goes wrong. Dear angry fans, you don't care if a studio is woke. You don't even care if they're following a woke agenda, unless you're actually a misogynist. That's not what's making you angry. The original Star Trek was super woke. I mean, so was Star Wars. I mean, heck, so was Dune. <laughs> Ripley, anyone? A fiction can be as woke as you like. That's not what's making you angry. It doesn't really make anybody angry. I mean, if all the wokeness went away and all the SJWs were fired, what's to stop some other people coming in and just with another agenda doing exactly the same thing. I mean, how would you feel if all the wokeness went away but Yoda became a shill for Pepsi? I mean, would you like it if your characters were being shilled out to an agenda that way? No, 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 the agenda doesn't matter. It's what it does to the characters that matters to you. It's called merchandising, John. It's been around for years. Yeah, well, so so-called wokeness and you actually don't mind either of them unless they start to take over and the story suffers. I mean, just how far would you let product placement go before you felt like your stories were being abused? And while we're on that subject, dear studios losing literally billions of dollars because of angry fans, nobody's hating your politics. Nobody really cares about your issues or what you stand for. Well, I mean, not nobody. There's always someone, isn't there? Getting most fans on your side is really, really easy, and it doesn't have anything to do with agendas or politics. They don't really affect anything. Say these words after me. Respect the myth. That's it. Just respect the fact that humans have been conditioned over millennia to be participants in a shared mythology. And that doesn't go away overnight. And you wouldn't want it to because that makes for dedicated, loyal, high spenders who will sell your property to all their friends and family. It doesn't matter if you own the IP. Those characters are part of people's lives and you don't own that relationship. If you disrespect it, prepare for the response. And we've seen it several times now. The studio's agenda doesn't matter, but when any ulterior agenda is seen as betraying the myth and altering the characters, making them unimportant and secondary to a means to an end, well then the response is predictable. Not because of the politics, but because you disrespected the myth. And I think the issue is only going to become more powerful in the future. We are at a unique and unprecedented point in human history where we've gone from millennia of practicing interactive participation mythologies into the last few centuries of creator, consumer and property rights. But now we have conventions, fan sites, YouTube and fanfic, and suddenly participation myth culture is back. There are three great examples of the tension between participational myth culture and intellectual property ownership as these seemingly incompatible ideas clash. A famous YouTuber called Star Wars Theory, obviously a Star Wars fan, decided to make his own fan fiction. He paid for it out of his own savings made it himself, paid for it himself, did everything he could to make sure it would not breach copyright, even hired someone to make an original score. It's a fantastic movie and you need to watch it. He even made it run ad free for the fans. But Disney and Warner Chapel filed a copyright claim so that they could start running ads on this, someone else's creation until someone at Lucasfilm stepped in and said, this is not the nature of the deal you struck Take those ads off, let the fans have this. And then there's Uri Studios, who make Star Trek based fan fiction. And they've made some movies and they are amazing. And they made one called Prelude to Axanar. And this became really famous because they raised an awful lot of money and they made this amazing production, including the use of actual Star Trek actors from the show. It's an amazing production. I highly, highly recommend this movie. And what did the rights owners of Star Trek do? They sued them. They actually launched a lawsuit against them. And in the end, J.J. Abrams was talking about how he had to speak to these people to say this is not how you treat your fans. And now, uh, within the next few weeks, it will be announced this is going away and fans will be able to work on their <laughs> And looking at this from a different angle, a guy called Eckhart's Ladder, surely the nicest guy on the internet, has been raging for a long time about what he's discovered, which is Marvel Comics repeatedly taking 
fan art and using it in their own publications. Without request, without permission, without credit, they are simply taking artists' original work and copying it, tracing it into their own works. And sure, we can say they own the copyright and the intellectual property rights of all Star Wars stuff, but you're not just talking about new artwork of existing Star Wars ships, you're talking about new ships that fans have designed to fit into the Star Wars universe. Marvel treated them as if they have no ownership of that whatsoever, and you can imagine what the fan response was to all of these three examples. To be clear, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not asserting who has the legal rights to what in any particular case, I don't know, but I am a fan, and I do know that legal disputes between studios and fans always causes the fans to suffer, which always causes the studio to suffer in turn when they start losing revenue. So who wins? Myth culture is the reality. It won't go away just because some producer with an idea wants to take things in a new direction. Ownership of the IP, well that's great, but it's a flea in the wind in comparison to the collective power of culture. Ignore that at your peril. Besides, the greatest opportunity a fiction creator could ask for is science fiction and fantasy fans who will loyally spend endless money on ticket sales and merch sales and everything else in a culture that they feel a part of, love to belong to and will stay with for literally decades. Who wouldn't want that? If The Last Jedi had been an original story with no backstory and no pre-existing emotional connection to the characters, it would have been judged on its own merits. Another original and brilliant movie by the maker of Looper. It's a beautifully shot movie with some great moments, but that seemed unimportant. Was that because some people are just never happy? Well, for some people, yes, but also because it had a backstory. People had an existing connection to the characters, and that's what matters most to the fans. It doesn't matter as much to viewers, but it matters to a lot of fans. If Picard had been the first Star Trek, people would have been intrigued by another dark, dystopian sci-fi with flawed, complex characters, perhaps like The Expanse or Dark Matter. People don't mind that sort of thing, but to some, that's just not Star Trek. And you won't fix their sense of loss with star cameos or better production in any future series. If Doctor Who had started with season 13 and Jodie had been the first Doctor, then nobody would have felt any betrayal of William Hartnell by his importance and status as the first Doctor being taken away. The quality of the writing, the acting, the politics, the agenda, whatever, would have mattered far less without that emotional connection being perceived as undervalued. That emotional connection that came through the exact sense of belonging and ownership that fans have and that makes Doctor Who so economically valuable. When you disrespect a culture's myth, even inadvertently, the quality of the production becomes secondary. Doing a great job of painting someone's house doesn't matter if you killed their dog. This has little to do with toxic fans. I mean, is it toxic to feel hurt when something that you love has been taken away from you? To complain that something that you felt you belonged to, identified yourself as being part of, is treated like a rug just pulled from under your feet? I mean, look at the difference between the fan reception of the Star Wars prequels versus the sequels. The Phantom Menace was not widely loved at the time. Attack of the Clones got a mixed response and was defended as being, well, it's better than The Phantom Menace. And I remember there was talk that St. George had lost it, that the quality was gone. And there probably was nostalgia and people disappointed that they couldn't relive their childhoods. But nobody felt betrayed. Nobody thought Star Wars was being taken away from them. They just thought the films weren't that great. So why do so many fans feel betrayed by the sequels? They're just sexists. Well, why would misogynists have love for a feminist icon? Unloved characters. Misa thinking must be something else, okay, day. So why? Two generals died in The Last Jedi in ways that communicate this perfectly. Admiral Akbar is so well known that he's an actual meme. He's a legacy character who fans have known since 1982. Then there's Admiral Holdo, who first appeared in the same movie she died in, and she gets a grandiose, meaningful hero's death. Akbar the Beloved gets unceremoniously sucked out of the window, and I can't think of a better symbol of how many fans felt they were being regarded. 
The old makes way for the new and is discarded, like yesterday's trash. It felt like, to many, the culture people had been a part of, felt they understood and felt connected to, had just gotten sucked out of the window along with Akbar. No meaning, no consideration. Like Akbar, they just didn't matter anymore. Whether it was meant to or not, it felt to many fans like the studio was saying, we own this and we'll do what we want. I'm not suggesting there was any such intention from the studio, but the perception was there in parts of the culture and that's all that was needed. Everybody in this world is protective of their culture, their way of life, and the following tit-for-tat war of words between studios and fans was only going to end one way, and it didn't help anybody. Owning the IP does not mean owning the culture that it spawned. Nobody has the rights to make money from Star Wars but Disney. That's legal, it's theirs, and it's their right. But they have no rights over the relationship between Luke and his fans. And if you're going to bank on that relationship, that love for your gain, then you must respect its importance. I'm not suggesting that this is the only cause of tension between studios and fans, or saying all fans are innocent angels. I mean, we argue a lot because debate is part of any culture, and any culture has its troublemakers and its jerks. Still, it'd be a mistake to, because of that, write off all fans as toxic or entitled. I mean, we're human, and we love deeply, and you can make a lot of money off that, if you respect it. I'm not trying to speak on behalf of or in respect to all fans. The fandom is full of people who absolutely love everything that's coming out these days. But taking Star Wars as an example, Disney has lost billions of dollars in revenue in merch sales and ticket sales since they've been producing these movies. This is not just a disgruntled few people, although there are always a disgruntled few people. But I don't want this all to be negative, so let me just give a few examples of how the culture working together can be a great thing. Let's talk about Ronald D. Moore, very well-known contributor to the Star Trek universe. He wasn't always. He was a fan who had written a script, but he had to sneak his way into getting that script in front of the people who needed to see it. As a fan, he went on a tour, and he gave the tour guide his script and persuaded him to pass it on to the powers that be. And that was the moment that Star Trek started accepting scripts from viewers and fans. Before that, they never had done, but now they started encouraging fans to send in scripts. No guarantee that it would ever be made into a show, but this was a partnership, and what it ushered in was surely the golden era of Star Trek. I think everyone would agree, this is the time Star Trek was at its most popular, most successful. For a while they were producing two shows at once, and the budget for Voyager was enormous because Star Trek was really working at, I suggest, the highest level it ever has. And now let's talk about Seth MacFarlane, the guy who went on to make The Orville, which many people said at the time was a better version of Star Trek than Star Trek. It was being compared favorably against Discovery, and so many reviews were saying that the Orville was a better version of Star Trek. Why is this important? Well, because Seth MacFarlane began making TV shows by creating Star Trek fan fiction. Imagine if he had been welcomed into the creating process of Star Trek itself because people had seen just how passionate and talented this guy was. Imagine. Oh, what could have been. Now, it might be that you think people are silly for treating fictional characters as if they're real and getting all bent out of shape over things that don't even exist. But then you're unaware, obviously, that you do the same thing every single day and with an awful lot more than TV characters. See, if you don't know the power of deep fiction and how it literally runs our societies, then you don't understand why the way all humans engage with reality is the same reason why they engage with any particular story. We're talking the secret source to creating a story that people love and characters that they'll want to connect to and a myth that an entire culture will want to form around. Deep fiction rules your life. It rules participational myth culture. It rules an awful lot more than you know. And in my next video, I'm going to lift the lid on exactly how it works. I do hope you'll join me. Thank you for listening.